Like a king, I may live in a palace so tall with great riches to call my own. But I don't know a thing in this whole. Well, good morning. We gather here together today for an important task, and that's to celebrate what God has accomplished through one man's life, our friend, our neighbor, Keith Bobeck. We come together in grief, acknowledging our human loss. May God grant us grace that in pain we may find comfort, in sorrow hope, and certainly in death, resurrection. I want to thank each person for being here today, and especially Patsy, I would like to thank you for giving the three of us the honor to say words over Keith. I also want to acknowledge that some, what, 48 years ago during a, on a Sunday in May in 1970, you and Keith joined hands, and some of the following vows were said. In the name of God, I, Keith, take you, Patsy, to be my wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, sickness and health, to love and to cherish until we are parted by death. This is my solemn vow. And then the vows were exchanged the other way around. I want to thank you for your witness in marriage and for honoring those vows that you and Keith partake in 48 years ago.
and for comforting Keith, to death do you part. During Keith's struggle is towards the end, we had a chance to read scripture together, to pray together. We thought about singing together, but we held off on that one. One of the scripture texts that I read and Keith laid there and listened to, see if you draw comfort from these words as well. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you know that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, for at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me, do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. When I visited with Keith, I asked him permission to go through Psalm 23. And as I was reading Psalm 23, it was beautiful because Keith joined me, and together we recited Psalm 23. Listen to these words of comfort. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want he maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the quiet waters. He restoreth my soul. He guides me on paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you art with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, as I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, ever, forever, and forever, with emphasis placed on forever. Let us pray. Eternal God, we praise you for the great company of all those who have finished their course in faith and now rest from their labor. We praise you for those dear to us whom we name in our hearts before you. Especially we praise you for Keith Bobeck, whom you have graciously received into your presence. To all, these, to all of these grant your peace let perpetual light shine upon them and help us to believe where we have not seen, that your presence may lead us through our, our years and bring us at last with them into the joy of your home, not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Keith gave Bobek 
age 71, left Topeka, Indiana, passed away Monday, June 4th, 2018 at 1.45 a.m. at home following a brief illness. He was born on April the 17th, 1947, son of Carl and Minka Bobak, in Topeka, Indiana on May the 27th, 1970. He married Patsy L. Kendall and they shared 48 years of marriage. He is survived by his wife, Patsy Bobak, of Topeka, Indiana, three daughters, Kelsey Broderick, Bobak of Canby, Indiana, Christina and Mitchie Dusher, at Obeck of Topeka and Kimberly Matt O'Connor of Tashkala, Ohio. Five grandchildren, Mason O'Connor, Carly O'Connor, Noah O'Connor, Gabriel O'Connor, and Macy Dushar, siblings. Karen, Carly Hus, uh, Carlin Hussettler of Shipshawana, Karen Ash of Wilkinsville, and Connie Leeming of Tampa, Florida. He was preceded in death by his parents, a brother, Kenneth Bobeck and a sister, Kay Bobeck. I appreciate the honor that uh, actually uh, Keith gave um, Patsy that Larry Burns, would, he would like to have Larry Burns speak. And I think she ran to her, what will he say? You know, he, he'll make up his mind, he'll, he'll do it. <laughs> and uh, that's how it all proceeded. And I've uh, known uh, uh, Keith for a number of years. Uh, I was related here in the uh, the fact that uh, the year he graduated from Topeka High School, I was pastor of a little church out east of town, uh, Green Chapel, Wesleyan Methodist Church. And uh, so that's really when, uh, when we really met. Uh, uh, actually, that same year, 65, was when I uh, pastored a church there in August. And uh, then as time went on, I got acquainted with him. And I thought I was a character until until I met Keith. Now, Keith is, was a character, but oh, he was so much fun. And we would ra raz each other. Really, uh, I can't understand here. See, he was, he graduated from Topeka High School in the class of 1960, and he was a class president. Can you imagine that? Uh, boy, he must have lost it after he, after he graduated from uh, high school. But uh, we know he was an outstanding athlete that ran across country and track and played basketball and volleyball. And it's kind of it's fitting for, uh, for the funeral to be held here because I think he went to school here maybe one year, Patsy said. And, and what was the comment? Something that they kicked him out or something like that because he was just too, too, too much to handle. But, uh, but again, uh, uh, of course, uh, his father was, uh, was one of the trustees when the, when the building was built back in 1930. So a lot of memories here. Now it's a cathedral. And uh, boy, this is beautiful. This is wonderful. And uh, we, uh, we give the Lord praise for that. But uh, and getting back to Keith, uh, uh, we had church league back there. I think they still have some church leagues around, but the Topeka, Walcott, Bucketville, and I think maybe Shipshawana churches uh, had a league. Now, you know how saintly uh, the boys play, you know, uh, being ch from church and all, uh, but it wasn't quite as saintly as you might think. And especially when you play against Keith and others uh, uh, from the various churches. And uh, uh, we, we had a few, I think we had a few prayer meetings afterwards. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but anyway, Keith loved basketball. That was the thing that he really loved. And, and he... Uh, played basketball right along, and uh, you know what? I don't know. It was just is it, this is not the original floor of, of the. This is the original basketball floor when Topeka uh, when Cathedra, Topeka High School was just had a little bo uh, box, you know, for gym, and they played their ball games here. Did they play their games here? Or was it, and, uh, and and boy, so this this is, and I could just see him uh, playing basketball here right now, you know, uh, shooting the ball and so forth. I don't know what particular shot he had, but he sure. Uh, played well and, and was an outstanding basketball player. Um, uh, and again, uh, that was uh, in, uh, uh, I was asking uh, Her uh, Harold uh, the fact when, when uh, the Chipshawana and the uh, Topeka teams came together. Now, uh, Westview School Corporation came into being in 1964, but it was two or three or four years later that their basketball teams came together. Up until that time, it was 
blood versus blood uh, on the basketball court. And he, uh, he was related one time when, uh, when Speaker was playing here and Shepsuano was playing here on a game and they went out to their vehicles. What did they put in their gas tank? They, were, they just came here for practice and there was sugar in the gas tanks when they went out. Oh, we, were, we lived in a saintly community, a <laughs> wonderful community. But, uh, but anyway, that's just a, just a ref, uh, re, uh, reflection on his life. He went on to, ser went on to serve his country uh, honorably in the United States Army from 1966 through 68, during which time he was stationed in Germany. Uh, Keith retired from the Yoder Farm Services in 2015 after 35 years of dedicated service. He was involved in 4-H for many years and he loved Alice Chambers. Did you, Chambers, did you see the one sitting out in front? Uh, that the, our friends down the road here uh, brought that in and, and uh, I remember him uh, dr driving those and Carl uh, using those there on the farm there on, on, uh, uh, on County Road 38. But, it, uh, but it's, it's wonderful. He loved Alice Chambers. No green for him. Oh, I can hear him now. Only orange all the way, you know. But uh, Keith was a member of the Topeka United Methodist Church. He formerly served on the LaGrange County Board of Zoning Appears. Now, this is Keith I'm talking about. You know, that one that's kind of a character? He served on the, he currently served on the Topeka area. Hi, I think that's hysterical society, not the historical society that he served on. If he was on the committee, that was what it was, hysterical society, uh, the board of directors. He will always be remembered for his love of people, his quick but dry wit, and his great sense of humor. He... He was something else, let me tell you. And I thank uh, God for the privilege that I had of uh, knowing him through the years. And, you know, we were about the same grade when it comes to talking back and forth, and he would start it, and I'd, uh, I'd add something to it. It just went back and forth. But, but it was always, uh, you know, it was always keys, you know. You, you knew what to expect when you encountered him at the coffee shop or wherever. Uh, he, uh, he hit you every time with, with some kind of wit, some kind of humor. But, uh, but he's, he's going to be missed. He's going to be missed. That's those there, uh, uh, that, that personality, which was so vibrant. And, and he, how, how he served the community, how he served the community in so many ways. It's, it's something to, to rejoice in it. After I heard that uh, Keith was uh, pretty bad off, and uh, after he... Uh, found out in his last visit uh, to the doctor that there was no, no other thing they could do. And um, so they sent him home. And hospice came in, I believe, about that time. But, uh, but uh, I, 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 was, I was hoping to get in before that because I knew he had had problems. And uh, so I, uh, I got in touch uh, with Patsy, and uh, I wanted to come over. And I think, did we come over twice or just once? I mean, just once. I think the first time you were on your way to the, the doctor's office or something. But anyway, uh, I came over then, uh, finally, uh, and uh, uh, Keith was there in his wheelchair, and uh, uh, he, uh, he was in the kitchen, and, and then he was, uh, he wheeled, I think you wheeled him in, or did he wheel himself in? But in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, the living room, and then I sat there in the, uh, in the, on the couch, uh, and, and he's facing me just a couple feet away, uh, face to face, and we began to re reflect. And uh, uh, there, there was no, uh, uh, no really. He knew it was inevitable. And people, that's one thing. Death is inevitable for all of us. Death is inevitable, and it's important for us to realize that. And uh, we find that uh, that there, that's the only exit out of this old, old world, death, uh, unless you're taken up in the church in the rapture. But uh, but again, uh, we need to be reminded of that in these days. And, and I think the older we get, this suffering, we, we, we look at suffering as, uh, as, as a, a toughie. But you know, God allows suffering to come into the world. And this is what Jesus did on the cross. He took my suffering and your suffering and the world's suffering on the cross. And he died there. And then we find that he rose again. He, he died, he buried, and he rose again. And then he came out of the grave, which confirmed his resurrection and the fact that we too will be resurrected in the end time. And some uh, resurrected to life and some uh, resurrected to death. And uh, it's, uh, it's exciting to look forward to it. I'm looking forward to it, you know. Uh, like I say, I, I like to 
I'd like to be taken up when he comes, but if not, I guess I'll have to die. But anyway, it's, it's, it's something serious to think about, people. We're going to die. We're going to die, and we're going to end up in one of two places. And the fact is, we need to make preparation. And Jesus Christ made that preparation when he died on the cross. He came to seek and to save those which uh, were lost or are, are lost, and that includes you and me and the whole world. And this is, what, uh, this is why missionaries uh, and uh, uh, ministries throughout the world are proclaiming the gospel. And people, let me tell you something, you don't hear much. God is reviving our world. Uh, we find in Africa, in the Muslim communities and so forth, Many are coming to Christ in an uh, unprecedented time, and it's just great to see God work. Uh, we prayed that prayer as we met before, uh, Thy kingdom come as, as uh, Thy king. Uh, pardon me. Um, uh, may your 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 come to your. Excuse me. Your will be done. You know, as is in, as in heaven on earth as well as in heaven, and it's being done, but it's going to be completed when He comes again. Woo, boy. And what a, what, a, what a day that will be. But until then, until then, we're going to just keep on keeping on. And again, as I, I sat there be, before uh, Keith, and, uh, and, and I just got real close to him. I said, Keith, have you ever received Christ in your life? And he shook his head, no. I don't think he said no. You know, would you like to today? And he said, yes. Wow. And uh, we uh, prayed uh, a prayer of confession, a prayer of, of ad, uh, first of all, of, of sins, ABC. I, I think about, uh, you know, finding salvation is ABC. Admit you're a sinner, believe on, uh, believe on, the, on, on the Lord, and see confessing. And we confess him when we're baptized. That's one way of confessing. And uh, he prayed uh, for his, uh, to ask God to forgive him. And then uh, the, the witness came to his heart that, that he was saved, that he was ready to go. He was packed up and prayed up and ready to go. And, uh, and I just uh, I thank God for the privilege of, of having that uh, opportunity to share Christ with him and see him brought to the Lord. It's just wonderful. Keith is wonderful. And so at this time, uh, uh, we're, we're going to ask uh, for the family tribute. So... I think uh, I think uh, Kelsey's going to be the first. The girls, all three, are, are quite talented. And I think Keith might have uh, assisted in that by maybe exiting the house when they, when they <laughs> practice. 
but uh, all three are, are, are very talented and, and God is using them in a, in a wonderful way. So I think it can. And it can. <coughs> okay, the first song I'm going to read is called Your Spirit. I know that no matter what, you will always be with me. When life separates us, I know it's only your soul. Saying goodbye to your body, but your spirit will be with you always. When I see a bird chirping on a nearby branch, I will know it's you singing to me. When a butterfly brushes gently by me, so care freely, I will know it is you assuring me that you're free from pain. When the gentle fragrance of a flower catches my attention, I will know you. it is you reminding me to appreciate the simple things in life. When the sun shining through my window awakens me, I will feel the warmth of your love. When I hear the rain pitter patter against my window sill, I will hear your words of wisdom, and I will remember what you taught us me so well, that without rain, trees cannot grow, without rain, flowers cannot bloom, Without life's challenges, I cannot grow strong. When I look out to the sea, I will think of your endless love for your family. When I think of mountains, their majesty and magnificence, I will think of your courage for your country. No matter where I am, your spirit will be beside me, for I know no ma matter what, you will always be with me. And the last one is telling us to celebrate his life and not to weep for him. So it says, Weep not for me, for I am gone, in the through the gentle night. Grief if you will, but not for long upon my soul's sweet flight. No need for tears, I am at peace, my soul now at rest. There is no pain, I suffer not, for with your loss I was blessed. I am in a place of comfort, the fear is gone, but those put those things into your thoughts, in memory I live on. Remember not my fight for breath. Remember not to strive. Please do not dwell upon my death, but celebrate my life. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, Tina was part of my congregation for years, and uh, she always was on my case. <clears throat> also, she was uh, an aide here at the school, and, and uh, bless her heart, uh, she was always on my case, and even he, even here, I got the the name back, back backwards. So, uh, so uh, this that was Tina, and uh, and now uh, Kim, or uh, is it play a CD? Is that correct? Yeah. It's good to be a Bovec Yesery. I've got it made. Ornery uncles, crazy aunts, and laughing's in my name. I've got you, Dad, and I'm happy in this family tree. You protected, you provided, worked incessantly. Counting daughters, one, two, three. Remember that time you came home and found a nice surprise. You let her stay and her puppies, though you she didn't despise. One night the clouds rolled in so fast the lights went out on main. You walked out, patrolled the porch, it smelled like fresh spring rain. Counting daughters, one, two, three, naming all of them but me. Playing board games and some cards, filling back spraying yard eating ice cream while we're watching late night tv shows but do 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 but oh don't know Three, naming all of them but me. 
Kim record, recorded that, I believe, when she was Ball State. Is that right? Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, that's wonderful. <coughs> now we're going to take a few minutes for you to uh, share in this celebration. And so uh, we don't have a mic, so you uh, can stand up, and uh, and then you can state your name. That would kind of be be nice to do, and and maybe your relationship uh, uh, to Keith, and um, we'll go from there. So uh, we'll be first. To share. We'll take a few minutes here uh, to do some reflection. <coughs> Now, I know Keith was not a saint, and I know some of you have some stories you would like to share uh, or a, a, a word or two. Okay.
Well, let me begin by just saying to Patsy and you girls, thank you for the privilege that Pastor Kevin, Pastor Larry, and I have of sharing in this service today. Thank you for the stories. Oh, my goodness. The thing we know is that Keith Bobeck never knew a stranger. And the minute he walked into a room, things were about to liven up. That ornery sense of humor. Yes, he loved Alice Chalmers. Couldn't believe it when I drove up to the building yesterday morning and there sat that tractor. Uh, he had a unique way of describing his love for Alice and his disdain for John Deere. He'd say, nothing runs like a deer or smells worse than a John. A lot of wisdom there, what can I say? Uh, there are a lot of stories, and let's be honest, there are some that we cannot tell here today. Uh, I was privileged to uh, graduate with him. There were 25, just to be clear on what Daryl said, there were 25 in our class. We were not the class of 25. I know we're getting older. Uh, I appreciated so much of the things that were on the display. I, I have a couple of confessions that I have to make. I have to repent because, um, Kim, I've already pirated your DVD as we were getting it ready to play here. Um, miraculously, it got stuck in a computer and a copy was made. I, I'm not quite sure how that happened. The other thing, I was, I was going through his report cards and there was the report card from his first grade. I borrowed it off the table. It's back there, but I had to make a photocopy. When he was a first grader here in beautiful downtown Honeyville, his teacher was Mary Jo Bontrager. His grades were interesting. <laughs> what I thought was even more interesting were the comments. First grading period. Apparently there were four grading periods back then. First grading period. Understand, Keith's the first grader. Keith is doing just fine. I was almost afraid of him after he... <laughs> afraid of a first grader? All right. <laughs> Don't laugh. You're not helping me here. I was almost afraid of him after hearing that he wasn't going to like school, but I enjoy him so much and depend on him to help me. However... Since the trouser episode, he sits in front. <laughs> and I don't believe any such thing uh, will have a chance again, Mary Jo. Who knows what the trouser episode was? <sighs> the last one. I have to read the last one, too. This, this is pretty priceless. Keith has been naughty the last couple, several days. It seems it didn't help that I was not here for those several days. I've been giving uh, him a little of his own medicine. Uh, I don't know if it will help. Well, he'll calm down. <laughs> uh, he's reading so much better. The grade isn't high, but Mr. Yoder felt I graded everyone too high last semester. That accounts for Keith's lower grade uh, when he does read better. Oh, the stories. Oh, my goodness. And we knew him. We loved him. And, and you know, obviously with Carl being on the school board, you would think maybe that tempered his behavior a little bit. Uh, I think if we knew how he restrained himself, we would compliment him on his efforts, quite frankly. Uh, I hope you share more of the story with uh, Patsy and Kelsey and Tina and Kim. They need to hear those stories. There, there's just something wonderfully uh, healing. There was an amazing thing that happened uh, yesterday afternoon at the visitation. Uh, I'd been in and out, and I walked in the back door and coming out was my cousin and he was in tears and he said I was named after Keith and I'm going oh my goodness I had no idea he said I don't know why I said well you should know why you were a baby how are you gonna know 
I said, I got to talk to your sister. But he said, all I know is that my folks would go to softball games and they'd go to K's games because my uncle Andy was a very uh, proficient softball pitcher. And they thought so much of Keith, the way he conducted himself. And I was named after him. What a wonderful, wonderful story. There are other stories I, I think of. We played a lot of basketball here. I remember, for those of you that went to Topeka High School, you remember the assembly hall. And you remember study hall, that solitary desk up front. I remember the day that Edgar Franklin was the study hall teacher. I'm pretty sure it was Keith that did this. Took a green eraser and uh, put some straight pins in it. And the goal was to bounce it off the front wall, have it come back and hit Mr. Franklin. The problem was his aim was somewhat errant, and the green eraser stuck in the American flag. <laughs> and it stayed there for a couple of days until we had an assembly, and the speaker came, and uh, Mr. Goal, the superintendent, was there, and we all stand up to do the Pledge of Allegiance, and the look on Mr. Gould's face was priceless. Uh, Denny Yoder told me this great story because Denny and Terry Roy, and I, I'm trying to think who else it would have been, would have been kids growing up at Topeka Mennonite, and uh, Keith didn't have a driver's license yet, but Denny did. So it's Sunday morning, and Keith is bored with the service. And there's a particular girl that he wants to see. He hadn't met Patsy yet. So he convinces Denny that they sneak out of church, and Denny drives him to see this girl, and they get back in time before the service is over. Priceless. And, Daryl, you'll remember the, uh, the cherry bomb incident yeah, we were in a lot of trouble because I, I think we were getting ready to leave for a game or a practice or something, and we're outside the school, and uh, somehow this cherry bomb shows up, and Keith lights it, and it, it explodes and takes off part of his nose. And for the rest of the season, he had to wear a nose guard. I'll tell you what, Gus Hoy was not a happy camper at all. And you've heard that, that Keith was uh, an amazing athlete, and he was. He held the, the school record. In fact, it stood as a Westview record for many, many years in high jump. He held the record at six foot one, and he was 5'10". So that tells you something about his leaping ability and um, all that he could do. He loved this community. He loved history. I was so pleased to have him to be a part of our board of directors for the Topeka Area Historical Society in spite of the fact that his health really limited uh, his involvement and in what he could do. Being a lover of history, like Keith, I had to look it up. Did, did you know that the day he was born, April 17, 1947, it was a Thursday? Harry Truman was the president. Jackie Robinson for you baseball lovers, got his first major league hit. It was a bunt single against the Boston Braves. What I thought was especially interesting was that there was a show debuted that day. It was the Abbott and Costello show, <laughs> debuted on the day that Keith was born. I don't know if that had anything to do with Keith's sense of humor or what. We knew and loved Keith. He wasn't an angel. I'm so thankful for Pastor Larry, Pastor Kevin, and the things that they shared with him and helping him find peace with God. You know, the powerful thing is Keith finished strong. He finished in faith. And those of us that saw him during the last several weeks of his life, we know, Patsy, you know, girls, you know how much your dad suffered. Um, it was just very difficult. The great thing is that he finished strong. 
And there's a couple of verses that came to mind, a couple of passages of scriptures that I want to share with you quickly. Now, that's dangerous. Anytime a pastor says, I have a couple of things to say, you know, you're in for a long time. But I'm so impressed with the last part of Genesis 49 and the first couple of verses of Genesis 50. And I want to just read a couple of verses there, and then I want to point something out from 2 Timothy 4 and end with a verse in Hebrews 12. We'll move through this quickly. But it's powerful, and I think it relates very profoundly to Keith's life and to us, why we are here today. Genesis 49, it says that when Jacob finished commanding his sons, because what Jacob does, he's near death, and he gets all of his kids together, all of his sons, and he speaks prophetically over each one. Now, when you read Genesis 49 and the prophetic things that he speaks, it is astounding how accurate the Holy Spirit gave him information of what his kids and those tribes turned out to be. So he speaks prophetically. Jacob finished commanding his sons. He drew his feet up on the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Then Joseph fell on his father's face and he wept and he kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physician, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Now, we read our English Bible, and we don't think a whole lot about this, but names are really important. When Jacob is born, when we meet him, Jacob, that always refers, when you read of that in the Old Testament, it always refers to his sinful fall, fallen nature. Jacob's name means supplanter, deceiver, the manipulator, the sneaky one. Literally, it means he who cheats. That was not Keith. Israel is the redeemed nature. God changes his name in Genesis 32. And I wish we had time to just really look into that because you'll recall if you know your Bible that Jacob wrestles with this angel all night long and isn't going to turn loose of the angel till he blesses him. And when you look at it in the original text, the angel says, what is your name? Now, it's God that picked the fight, so God knew good and well who he was fighting with. But the sense in the original text, when the angel of the Lord, who is actually the Lord, says, what's your name? The sense is, in shock of realization, he said, Jacob, the sneaky one, the supplanter, the manipulator. And God says, your name from now on will be Israel, the one that God manipulates and that God controls. What's interesting in these verses that I read to us, Jacob dies. But it is Israel who is embalmed. The old nature dies. And for us as people of faith, the old nature dies. But it's the new nature that's preserved. That's the glorious part of salvation. If you have your Bible, just look with me quickly. Genesis chapter 4. Paul's near the end of his life, and he writes to this young preacher, Timothy, and he says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who love his appearing. Now, Paul's near the end of his life. He knows he says to Timothy a little bit earlier, he says, I'm ready to be poured out as a drink offering. We know that that wicked Roman emperor Nero is going to have him beheaded very shortly. But Paul looks back on his life. What a, what a privilege it is to look back on our lives and to reflect, okay, what's my life been? Paul says, I fought the good fight. Life's a battle. It was a struggle for Keith, and especially in the last weeks. It was a battle. Paul says, I finished the race. There's that old adage, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And I don't know if you realize this, but, but there is something of a miracle that takes place as I think of Keith. 
Most people who become Christians do it as children and as teenagers. But it's almost a statistical impossibility that someone over 60 becomes a Christian. What a blessing that in those final weeks of his life, Keith could find real peace with God. Not only believing in God, he grew up in church. He believed in God, he just didn't know him. And that's true of so many people. Paul says, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith. And you know, he did that in two ways. Number one, he kept the faith by doing what God told him to do. But he also kept the faith by passing it on. Particularly, I think of in 2 Timothy, he's writing to this young preacher, Timothy, and he calls him my son in the faith. He passed it on. You know, we have a responsibility to pass on this faith. And I think of Carl and Nadine. Nadine was always my favorite in the kitchen in Topeka Elementary School because when they had Spanish rice for lunch, she knew I liked it, and she always gave me extra. But there was a heritage of faith that was passed on as a family. Don't lose that. Make that a part of who you are. And Paul has no doubts about what's coming. And I'm not talking about death. He's talking about after death. He said, henceforth, I know, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the righteous judge is going to give to all who love his appearance. Paul has no doubts about what awaits him. Eternity is not a question mark. It is not a mystery. He knows what's waiting on the other side. Early Monday morning, as you heard, 1.45, Keith stepped into eternity. Most of us were sleeping, and he stepped into eternity, and I believe he did so with peace with God. I don't know if you realize this, but songs that are being played, things that are being done today, are in keeping with Keith and Patsy's wishes. You're going to hear the song, He Touched Me in a Little Bit, something that they wanted played. I believe early Monday morning, that song took on whole new meaning for Keith. It's interesting. When Keith stepped into eternity, he became a part of what Hebrews 12 talks about. If you know your Bible, you know that in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, there's this long list of of the heroes of faith and their named and their exploits in faithfulness to God. And then it says, and many others of whom the world was not worthy. And when you go into chapter 12, understand that when chapters and verses were not originally in the manuscripts, they were put in later so that we could find our way around in the scriptures. And I, for one, am so grateful. But the thought continues on as chapter 11 comes to a conclusion, talking about all these heroes of the faith. And he says, therefore, because of all that has been outlined in chapter 11, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, is now seated at the right hand of the Father. For consider him who suffered such contradiction of sinners, lest you become weary and faint in your mind because you haven't resisted unto blood yet. Powerful things. And you know, as we gather today, we honor the memory of Keith. But this is really for us. It's really for those of us who are a part of the living to deal with the reality of what has happened. And you know, there are many people who will not come to a funeral visitation. They will not go to a funeral because they can't deal with it. And what they can't deal with is it reminds us, as Pastor Larry said, 
that unless Jesus comes back first, not one of us is going to get out of this world alive. The writer of the Hebrews says, put your focus on the right place. And that's on Jesus. Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You know, there's absolutely nothing that we can do to earn our salvation. The only thing that we bring to salvation is the sin that requires it. It's God that does it. God opens our hearts to know him. I was so blessed when I heard the story of... Uh, earlier, not just this morning. I heard this before. Pastor Kevin is reading the 23rd Psalm, and Keith begins to quote it. Because you see, there's been a heritage of faith that that was deposited within his heart. And now God is calling that forth and bringing that back. Can I encourage some of you parents and grandparents who have children and grandchildren who aren't walking with the Lord if you've sowed good seed into their hearts, into their lives spiritually, I believe the day will come. You keep praying, you keep encouraging, but I believe the day will come when God will bring that harvest of faith back. I love that 23rd Psalm, and I, and I want to close with this. One of my favorite stories is the story uh, about a very famous Shakespearean actor who was known everywhere for his one-man show readings and recitations from the classics and he would always end his performance by reciting the 23rd Psalm each night without exception as the actor would begin his recitation the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want the crowds would listen so attentively and then at the conclusion of the psalm they would rise to their feet in thunderous applause and appreciation with this actor's incredible abilities. But one night, just as the actor was about ready to do his customary recital of the 23rd Psalm, a young man from the audience spoke up and said, Sir, do you mind if I recite the Psalm 23 tonight? Well, first of all, the actor was shocked to be taken back and taken back by this unusual request. How could anybody stand up and interrupt him after all this was his to do. But he decided to let the young man go ahead. After all, he was young, unskilled. No match for his rhetorical prowess. But with a soft voice, the young man began to recite the words of Psalm 23. When he finished, there was no applause. There was no standing ovation as there had been other nights. The only thing that could be heard was the sound of weeping. The audience had been so moved by this man's recitation, every eye was full of tears. Amazed by what he'd heard, the, uh, uh, the order went to the young man. He said, I don't understand. I've performed Psalm 23 for years. I have a lifetime of experience and training but I've never been able to move an audience like you moved them tonight. Tell me, what is your secret? And I think you know what's coming. The young man quietly responded and said, Well, sir, you know the psalm, but I know the shepherd. When you know the shepherd, it makes all the difference in the world. This morning, as you heard Psalm 23 being read, if you're like me, I was sitting there and I was quoting it right along. See, I believe that Keith, in those last weeks of his life, came to know not just the psalm, but came to know the shepherd in a greater way than he'd ever known him before. What about you? Do you know the shepherd? As painful as this is today, we know that those of us
who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, death is not the end. To be sure, it is a painful separation. One of my favorite movies is the movie A Man Called Peter that came out in the 1950s. It's the story of that great Scottish preacher, Peter Marshall, who became the chaplain of the U.S. Senate. Many of you read the books by his late wife, Catherine Marshall. I love the line in the movie. I don't know if it really happened or not, but I love this line. He's laying on that ambulance cart, and they're taking him out of the house because he's had major heart problems, and he's not going to survive this. But Catherine is so distraught in the movie, and he looks up at her and said, Oh, darling, I'll see you in the morning. What an awesome thing to know that we're going to see our loved ones in the morning. And if I understand Hebrews 12.1 at all, I believe that without question, Keith is now part of that heavenly cloud of witnesses. And if we could only see, if we could only hear, I believe that they are cheering us on from the other side. Be faithful, be faithful, be faithful. You know the psalm, but do you know the shepherd? So we close in a moment with this song that Keith and Patsy wanted. Again, I would say that Keith has experienced this touch from the master's hand in ways that we can't even begin to imagine. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your amazing grace. Lord, we thank you for Keith. We've known him and loved him. And the stories that we have, yeah, those stories, those memories, now that he is gone, become treasures. Father, what we rejoice in above all is that because Keith has put his faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, death is not the end. And when we go to the cemetery in a few moments and we lay his earthly body to rest, we know that's not where Keith is. It's where his body will be. Because we know, as people of faith, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And Lord, so for us who remain, would you by our spirit, by your spirit, touch our spirits, touch our hearts, so that we not only know the psalm, but we know the shepherd. As we listen to these words that are being sung in a few moments, Holy Spirit, would you touch us and change us for your glory that we can know that same peace that Keith experienced, a peace that goes far beyond our ability to understand, comprehend, but a peace that is so profound that in the midst of any heartache, every storm, we can say, he's touched me, he's made me whole. We ask you to do it. We ask you to comfort this family, encourage their hearts, and strengthen their faith. In Jesus' name, amen.
song.